Alright. Proverbs 16, verse 15. When a king's face brightens, it means life. His favor is like a rain cloud in spring. A ruler that can do anything he wants to do, anything at all, from granting favors to chopping off somebody's head, he causes his people to breathe a sigh of relief whenever he's in a good mood. Verse 16 says, How much better to get wisdom than gold, to choose understanding rather than silver. Now, there's nothing wrong with gold, nothing wrong with this world's wealth, but it should not be our top priority. That is for sure. And that's the message of this verse. The godly wisdom that you attain through the study of God's Word in this life is going to stick with you forever. Did you know that when you die, you retain your mind? You retain your person. You will always be you. You will have your mind, your emotions, your will. It will be sanctified if you're a Christian, and it will no longer be, you know, sin will no longer be an issue. But the things you have learned, you will retain. And so the godly wisdom you have attained, the knowledge of God and His Word that you have attained through studying and reading and listening to messages like this, that will stay with you forever. That's why it's such a wise thing uh, for you to do. Because the earthly wealth you obtain, that doesn't stay with you forever. You have to leave it behind. So you can work your tail off for the things of this world and you're leaving every single bit of it behind once you die but not your godly wisdom that will go with you and will stay with you forever and that by itself is a good enough reason to pursue knowledge of God more than this world's wealth 17 the highway of the upright avoids evil he who guards his way guards his life the highway of the upright avoids evil If, if you're listening to this program or watching this program in Wausau and you are up by let's say you want to travel from the tech on the north side of town to D.C. Everest way on the other side of town down in the town of Weston you want to go from the north side of Wausau to D.C. Everest down in the town of Weston well and it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon by all means avoid Grand Avenue do not take Stewart Avenue do not take 3rd Avenue do not take Grand Avenue just avoid it. The best thing you can possibly do is hop on the bypass. Get right on the bypass outside of, of the tech there, and you get off right by D.C. Everest, and you have, you have it made. Taking the bypass will allow you to avoid a lot of trouble. You can avoid the bumper, the bumper traffic that will be there at 5 o'clock. You, know, you can avoid all the city buses that are going to be stopping in front of you, and you'll have to stop constantly for that reason. You can just avoid a lot of red lights and a lot of trouble. You avoid a lot of trouble by taking the bypass. And it's the same in the spiritual realm. Same way with walking with Christ. Walking with Christ is like taking the bypass. It puts you on a spiritual bypass that allows you to avoid a lot of problems. You can avoid a lot of heartaches, a lot of headaches, by staying in fellowship with God. Because there's a negative domino effect that occurs when we disobey God. And so hop on the Jesus bypass and bypass all these problems that would otherwise come your way. It's just a lot smarter way to live. The highway of the upright avoids evil. Look at verse 18. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before fall. Pride goes before destruction. Yeah, and the higher level of pride you have, the further you have to fall. When God humbles you, and the higher of level of pride you have, the louder the crash will be when you fall and you hit bottom. And I can tell you this, a prideful person can count on at least one thing from God. They can count on God bringing them a humiliating experience that will knock them down to size. Verse 19, better to be lowly in spirit and among the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. 
In other words, God is saying it's better to be humble and poor. Better to be humble and poor than it is to be rich but prideful. Because pride is a sin. And you know, as far as God is concerned, God does not count greatness the way man counts greatness. As far as God is concerned, the greatest person in his kingdom is the one who humbles himself more than anybody else and serves other people with no thought of getting anything in return more than anybody else. That's the greatest person in God's kingdom. That's what Jesus said. Verse 20, Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers. And blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Now, notice the connection between the first part of verse 20 and the second part. Whoever heeds to instruct or gives heed to instruction prospers. And the, the instruction is the word of God. Instruction out of God's word. So whoever who listens to that prospers. And blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. And of course, trusting in God precedes giving heed to the instruction that he gives. You're not going to listen to somebody and do what they say unless you trust them. And it's the same in our relationship with God. And like I said, the instruction that we must listen to, that is God's instruction, His holy word. If we follow what God says, trusting that He knows what is best, even if we don't understand, then we will be blessed. If you trust God, you'll listen to His instruction and you'll be blessed. Verse 21. The wise in heart are called discerning. And pleasant words promote instruction. Or words, the wise in heart, are called discerning. And his words make a... Or the words of of a discerning man like that are persuasive. That is the alternate translation in this Bible. I kind of like that one better, actually. The point is this. Instruction is appreciated if the instructor is prepared. If the instructor is full of the word of God and prayed up, his instruction is going to be appreciated because he's prepared. And so it is appreciated if, if the instructor is prepared. It is also appreciated if he instructs with the desire to help those that he is teaching. Pleasant words is how the Bible describes his teaching. Pleasant words show that he's prepared and that he cares. The, his words are pleasant to those who listen. Look at verse 22. Understanding is a fountain of life to those who have it. But folly brings punishment to fools. A fountain of life speaks of refreshment, doesn't it? Understanding is is refreshment to the soul of the person who has it. If you walk with God and you read his words, it is as if you are going through life with a never-ending supply of fresh water and you might think, well, what's the big deal about that? And I suppose we would think that way, at least in this area, because there's plenty of fresh water. That's not even an issue. If you can't get good water out of your tap, you go to the store, pay 59 cents for a gallon. It's no big deal. But back in those days, fresh water, a fountain of life, was a huge deal because water was not easily come by, come by a lot of times. And so what God is saying is a growing knowledge of his word is going to refresh you and renew you on the inside. What if you live in rebellion and you're not in God's word? Then you're not going to feel very refreshed and renewed. You're You're going to sort of stumble through life, all hot and sweaty and bothered, bouncing from one stress to another and one mess to another. 23. A wise man's heart guides his mouth. And his lips promote instruction. A wise man's heart guides his mouth. Wise men make sense when they talk. The popularity of a wise man, somebody who is full of the word of God and speaks the truth in accordance with God's word, the popularity of somebody like that does not depend on his Great, great intellect, you know, on him, on him having a great intellect. It doesn't depend on him using huge words, half, half of which 
people can't even understand. His popularity doesn't depend on that. Popularity of the person like that doesn't depend on his ability to entertain. It's not about that. It's a clear, simple truth that a person like that speaks that, that makes people want to listen to him. Verse 24. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. If you want to feel good for a short time, you want to feel good. You want to get a shot of energy? Have a candy bar. That will do it every single time. Just eat something sweet. And God says, look, notice what God says here. Pleasant words are a honeycomb. He's saying pleasant words are like a candy bar, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. And what he is saying is, if you give somebody encouragement from God's word, they're going to feel good and they're going to be energized, just as if they ate a candy bar, only better because of the effects will last longer and there won't be a crash. Verse 25. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Some people say, well, you need to listen to your heart. You know, they, they say, listen to what your heart tells you. Some people say, get in touch with your feelings and then go with your feelings. I want to say, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? A person who would say something like that knows absolutely nothing about human nature. I don't care how many degrees they have, they know nothing about human nature, and they sure don't know anything about God's Word, because your heart is all messed up. And so is mine. Because of our sin nature. You can't trust what your heart tells you. You certainly don't want to go with what your heart tells you. Go with your feelings. That is a recipe for disaster. Your heart is going to tell you what seems right to it. And your heart is going to tell you what seems right to you. But if you follow it, God says you're going to, you're going to end up ruined. Follow not the leading of your heart. Follow the leading of God's Word. And follow the leading of your heart to the degree that it is consistent with God's Word. Verse 36. 26, I'm sorry. It says, The laborer's appetite works for him. His hunger drives him on. Hunger motivates a person to work. God realizes that. That's why he put it in his Word. Now we can learn something about economics, actually, from this verse. Hunger motivates a person to work. If you didn't have to pay for your food, or you didn't have to pay for your housing, or you didn't have to pay your bills, I doubt very much that you would get up at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the morning and go to a job. Especially if you didn't like it. You wouldn't do it. You wouldn't work very hard if you didn't have to pay for your bills. Now, God created man to work. But God also created man to benefit from his work. The reason that socialism and communism is such a miserable failure, no matter where it is tried, is because it removes much of the incentive to work. People have to give most of their wages to the government to be redistributed. And so that's why it fails. It's unbiblical. Verse 27. It says, A scoundrel plots evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. I don't think we use that word too often, if ever. The word scoundrel. You hear it a lot, maybe, but do you really know what it means? A scoundrel is a mean person. A scoundrel is a worthless individual. A scoundrel is a type of person who goes out of his way to dig up evil. He goes out of his way to dig up scandal. He hunts for evil. He looks for it. Now, it's one thing to expose sin when it becomes evident that somebody is sinning. That is something that God commands his church to do, to expose sin, so that the person who is sinning will repent and confess and get back on track with God. It's one thing to expose sin in the church, but it's something entirely different to dig for flaws in order to make somebody look bad. I think a lot of political campaigns are run 
by scoundrels who dig for flaws in order to make somebody look bad. Verse 28. A perverse man stirs up dissension. And a gossip separates close friends. Some people are so skilled with gossip. So skilled at planting seeds of destruction in other people's minds. They are so good at it. They can separate close friends, like God says right here. Some people are very skilled at planting seeds of doubt in people's minds concerning other people's character. They're very skilled at that. And those seeds of doubt and those seeds of strife can poison even the closest friendships and drive a wedge between people. Verse 29. A violent man entices his neighbor and leads him down a path that is not good. A violent man entices his neighbor. It's bad to sin yourself, but it's even more depraved to entice others to sin along with you. Bad enough to delight in your own sin, but it's even more depraved to get some sort of vicarious satisfaction from the sins of others. 30. He who winks with his eye is plotting perversity. He who purses his lips is bent on evil. It's amazing how facial expressions can sometimes reveal what is in a person's soul. Sometimes people can say one thing with their words and something entirely different with their face at the same time they're saying those words. Verse 31. Gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained by a righteous life. Now, gray hair definitely indicates a long life. You've been around for a while if you've got gray hair. And it's the reward of a righteous life. In the same way that Psalm 55 verse 3 says that a wicked person doesn't live out half of their days. It's not a 100% true all the time thing. It's, it's not an absolute promise. Neither one of them is, are. But they are both general truths. What God is saying is that a long life is sometimes the reward of a righteous life. But we all know that sometimes righteous people die very young. And a short life is sometimes the result of a sinful life. But we all probably can agree that there, are, there have been some terrible people who have lived a long time. And so these are general truths. Verse 32. Better a patient man than a warrior. A man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. It is a tough thing at times to control your temper. Anger isn't always sin. If you are, if you are anger, angry over the fact that God is being dishonored or somebody innocent is suffering... That's a good reason to be angry. But then you've got to be careful not to vent your anger in a sinful way. So some anger is just inherently sinful because it's selfish. Most anger is. Other anger, anger that is legitimate anger, righteous indignation, is sometimes expressed in a sinful way. So angry, angry people, they, they, sometimes, they sometimes sin. And it's tough. And many people can conquer others easier than what they can conquer themselves. That's what God is saying here in verse 32. It's easier to overpower others than it is to overpower our own flesh sometimes. What God is saying is it takes more strength to control our anger than it does to pin somebody on their back. Verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision, decision is from the Lord. And this may surprise you, but casting lots was sort of like, well, sort of like flipping a coin or shaking the dice. The same thing. And in the Old Testament, and actually until the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost, casting lots was one way of discerning God's will. Now, we're not do that anymore. Um, 
we have the Holy Spirit, and we have the complete revelation of God, the Word of God, and through reading the Word and through prayer and through the leading of the Holy Spirit, we can discern God's will for our lives. We don't have to shake dice. And, and since the day of Pentecost, that has not been a prescribed way by God to do it. But it was in the Old Testament. It seemed like pure chance, but God in His sovereignty was there determining if it was going to be heads or tails. Look at verse 1 of chapter 17. Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. It is a sad thing when a couple or a family sits down to eat supper together and they got you know a table full of food they all have steaks they all have beef roast they all have fried chicken or whatever and nobody talks to each other it is a sad thing when a couple or a family sits down to eat nobody says anything except maybe give me the meat or where's the potatoes or you forgot the napkins again. Something like that. That's that's a sad thing. It'd be a lot better if all they had was dry toast. But at least cared about each other. Verse 2. A wise servant will rule over a disgraceful son and will share the inheritance as one of the brothers. A competent servant, employee, deserves to rise higher than a son who doesn't care. If a leader is smart, he's going to promote a hired hand who is competent, who knows what he's doing and tries over a relative who's just a goof-off. Verse 3. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. A hot crucible can melt silver. That's what it's used for. To melt silver to turn it into a liquid and it's, it's used to separate all the impurities from the silver when you melt silver the impure, any impurities that are in those silver bars or whatever it might be will rise to the surface and you just take a scraper and scrape the impurities off and what you are left with is pure silver and so that's what a crucible does God allows trials to come into the life of his people trials do not necessarily mean that you are out of God's will if you're a Christian sometimes they are God's will and God allows them into our lives for the same purpose as we put silver in a crucible same thing they test our faith and in the process of testing our faith they draw us closer to God as we fall on our knees and pray to God for strength you pray probably more when you are going through times of trial than you ever do you're in the Word probably more than in times of trial than you ever are. Why? See, God allows these things into our life to test our faith and to strengthen our faith. And when it's all over, just like the silver that has been put in the furnace, our faith has been purified. Four. A wicked man listens to evil lips. Stop right there for a second. Wicked people listen to evil lips. Wicked people In other words, like evil talk. Wicked people like evil talk. It is not okay to laugh at the filth that is seen on television today. It is not okay to laugh at the things, the filth, the ungodly garbage that is put into most movies today. It is not okay to feel entertained by ungodly things. There's something wrong with you. If you are. And if you are a Christian, you find yourself doing that, all sorts of alarms should be going off in your spirit because you are not right with God. You've fallen away. Verse 4 again. A wicked man listens to evil lips. A liar pays attention to a malicious tongue. A liar, an ungodly person, likes to listen to slander, God says. 
a liar, an ungodly person likes to listen to slander. You know what this tells me? It tells me the kind of talk that you like to listen to, the kind of stories that you like to read, the kind of shows you like to watch, the kind of movies you like to watch, the kind of lis- music you like to listen to, are all barometers of the condition of your soul. Verse 5. He who mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. Stop right there for a second. If a person mocks the poor, making fun of them in some way, God says, they are insulting me. You mock somebody who is poor, God says, you are mocking me. You are insulting me. I'm taking it personally. poor person probably doesn't have any help in this life for the most part. They don't have anybody they can turn to for aid in the world because they're poor. But they can count on the fact that God is on their side, which does not bode well for those who make fun of them or take advantage of them in some way. Verse 5 again. He who mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. Whoever gloats over disaster will not go unpunished. Anyone who gets some sort of satisfaction, joy over the misfortune of others, and there are people like that, they are going to be punished by God. I know people who automatically get into a good mood when they see other people suffer. I don't know what it is. But they do. They enjoy the misfortune of others. They enjoy when other people fail. They enjoy it when other people suffer. They're going to be punished by God. And even if the disaster, the calamity, the pain, the suffering, even if those things are a consequence of a person's sin, that still doesn't give anybody the right to rejoice over it. Even if they're being punished by God, they have no right to rejoice over it. You want to read about this? Another example of this? Where it's taught? Read the book of Obadiah in the Old Testament. It's one chapter. The book of Obadiah. One chapter. Very short. It's all about the nation Edom. Who were Israel's neighbors in the Old Testament. And it's about how God punished the nation Edom. Because when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians, the Edomites sat by and applauded. They rejoiced in the sufferings of the Israelites. And here's the thing. The Israelites were suffering at the hands of Babylon. They were being destroyed, ransacked, taken into captivity because of their horrible sins. So this was punishment from God and yet God still punished Edom for laughing at their calamity. And so these people that gather outside of prisons and there's this party atmosphere when somebody is executed, that is dead wrong. God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. And neither should we. Six. Children's children are a crown to the aged. And parents are the pride of their children. And that's the way it should be. And what God is saying is there's no place for a generation gap. Parents should be the pride of their children. And children should be a a source of joy for the parents and the grandparents. That's the way God has designed it to be. There's no place for a generation gap, especially in the church. There's no place for a generation gap. I guess I can understand how it could be in the world because there's so much other garbage in the world. Why not that? But not in the church. That is absolutely dead wrong to have a generation gap in any church because we need each other. And, you know, the older Christians need the energy of a younger Christian and the younger Christian need the wisdom of older Christians and we need each other and that's the way God has designed it to be but one of the byproducts of worldliness in the church today is a generation gap in many areas of Christianity and it's not right shouldn't be there and it won't be there not if, not if people are sold out to God and full of the Holy Spirit and focused on Jesus. It's not going to be any generation gap. Your best friend could be somebody 50 years older than you or 50 years younger than you if you're both filled with the Holy Spirit. And you enjoy each other's company. Seven. 
Arrogant lips are unsuited to a fool. How much worse lying lips to a ruler. I like the alternative translation better. Eloquent lips are unsuited for a fool. You don't have high, you don't have high expectations from somebody who you know is foolish. You don't have high expectations for eloquence from somebody who you know is ungodly. You just don't expect much. In fact, you'd be shocked if they ever said anything worth listening to. And in the same way, we don't expect eloquence from fools. We we also don't expect our leaders to lie to us. It's It's not fitting for a fool to speak with eloquence and wisdom, and it's not fitting for our leaders to lie to us. We expect those that we trust to lead us to at least tell us the truth. They don't have to be the smartest people in the world. They don't have to be the most eloquent people in the world. But they do have to be honest. Verse 8. Character does matter, doesn't it? A bribe is a charm to the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he succeeds. Boy, isn't that the truth? In this sinful world that we live in, a bribe works like a magic charm. It works like a magic wand. You know the old fairy stories when you're little. Wave the magic wand and you know, have your will be done. Get something that you otherwise could not have. That's how, a, that's how a bribe works in this world. A bribe is just like a magic wand. You give somebody a bribe, and all of a sudden doors of opportunities open up magically. You give somebody a bribe and you get special favors from somebody. It's like waving a magic wand. You give somebody a bribe and you get out of trouble. Sometimes even out of jail. It's like waving a magic wand. It wouldn't work if this world wasn't so depraved. Verse 9. He who covers over an offense promotes love. Stop right there for a second. He who covers over an offense promotes love. Causes love to grow. You... When you love someone, you will overlook faults. You will overlook faults when you love someone. And when you overlook one another's faults, you will cause the glue that binds you together to become stronger and stronger. But look at the flip side. He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter, repeats the offense separates close friends, repeats the matter, continues to do it. Is one way to take that. If you continue and continue to to commit that same offense to the person that you're supposed to love, and you don't change. I mean, months go by, years go by. It's the same old thing. And they keep forgiving, and they keep overlooking. You know, eventually it's going to get to the point where even even though they may not have unforgiveness in them, It is impossible to have that tight relationship that you otherwise would have. And and another way this is true, too, whoever repeats the matter, separates close friends, repeats the matter in the sense of not being forgiven and always bringing up past offenses. People who always bring up past offenses or past sins will quickly ruin what what otherwise could have been a great relationship. Because we all have flaws, we all blow it. And if you're going to harp on somebody's occasional you know, faults and occasional sins against you, and you're going to magnify those things, well, you can just kiss that relationship goodbye, because it's not going to be there. Verse 10, I stop with this. A rebuke impresses a man of discernment more than a hundred lashes a fool. If you are a man of discernment, a woman of discernment, you love God. And you have a heart for the truth and a desire to do what is right in the eyes of God. People who are sensitive to God like that usually don't need anything more than a gentle rebuke. That's all they need, a gentle rebuke. On the other hand, those who are indifferent and uncaring and just do not concern themselves with what God wants or what.